So here's the story. Jackie Robinson, legendary baseball player, civil rights icon, broke the color barrier to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers. A 275 pound bronze statue of him was stolen from a park in Wichita, Kansas. There's even video. Two guys in the middle of the night a few weeks ago, they approached the statue, which you can see over here. And keep your eye on the timestamp because this first part only takes about 30 seconds. They cut the statue off at the shoes. It topples over. Less than two minutes later, a truck pulls up. They load what they can into the back and the whole heist is over, start to finish in about three and a half minutes. Police just arrested one of the guys they say was involved. If you try to take something for this community, uh, it won't be tolerated, and we will use all of the resources in the town to the Wichita Police Department to bring you to justice. But from this, two interesting revelations. One, yes, this was a statue of a civil rights legend, but no, police don't think this was a hate-motivated crime. Instead, we believe this theft was motivated by the financial gain of scrapping common metal. So, okay, this was for bronze scrap. But two, within just a few days of the theft, firefighters responding to a call found pieces of the statue in a burning trash can at Garvey Park, which is about 10 minutes south. I don't know which garbage can it was, but this is just to give you an idea of the area. So what was the plan exactly? How do you make money from a stolen footless statue of Jackie Robinson, and why would you light it on fire? Because any expert will tell you that's not how you melt something down for scrap metal. Melting bronze is probably not for the average person. I'd say that that was probably a bit further than they were uh, realized they could go. They were probably trying to melt it. So the conclusion is they're good at cutting, but they don't know anything else about metals. Ben Stickle literally wrote the book on scrap metal theft. Now he's an associate professor at Middle Tennessee State University. I began to realize no one had ever really researched it before, and there wasn't a lot of data on it, but looking for people who were involved with the crime, um, kind of hung out with some of them, asked some questions about how and why they did it. We know scrap metal theft has been a thing for a long time. Headline after headline after headline. And it doesn't really matter where in Canada or the U.S. you look, it happens all the time, everywhere. There are a couple of avenues that people can do once they've stolen a piece of metal. One is they can go obviously directly to like a recycling center or a scrapyard and try to sell it. Ultimately, it ends up going usually to a recycling or a scrapyard center, but how it gets there can be very different. Ben says scrap metal thefts are really driven by price. The going rate for bronze at a scrapyard? About 240 U.S. a pound. Not 240 though, $2.40 a pound. And that's if the scrapyard will even take it off your hands. So we actually called a bunch of scrapyards in Wichita. And by the way, there are way more scrapyards there than I would have guessed. And the very first one we called told us that they don't even accept bronze. Because what do you typically make with bronze? Statues and memorial plaques exactly the kind of thing that if a random dude comes up to you and says, hey, I've got some bronze to sell you, maybe you shouldn't buy it because there aren't that many plausible reasons for the average person to suddenly have a lot of bronze for sale. Usually those places are pretty decent about identifying folks who've stolen things. The likelihood that a scrapyard is gonna buy that statue is you know, probably not very high. In BC, for example, they passed a law requiring sellers to prove ownership of whatever scrap metal they were selling and metal dealing became almost like gun ownership. Customer information would have to be recorded and there were reporting safeguards built in to alert police of possible stolen goods. And back in Wichita, some dealers told us they wouldn't accept just any old person coming in off the street with a truck full of bronze. They say you typically have to represent some kind of business and be like a plumber with an ongoing relationship to sell legitimate scrap. Now, that's not to say that there's no market for stolen scrap, because if that were true, it wouldn't get stolen. But I'm just saying, the market for a stolen bronze statue isn't the easiest thing in the world to navigate. But let's say you found someone willing to buy your sketchy scrap bronze for about $2.40 a pound. How much did these thieves really hope to make? Well, 
The reporting that I've seen puts the statue's weight at around 275 pounds. So 275 times 240, you end up with $660, which is a whole lot less than the value of the statue whole, which was pegged at around $75,000 US. But what the thieves may or may not have known is that the statue is hollow. We called the folks who have the mold to make a new one. They're gonna replace the statue since the old one is broken. And they told us hollow is how you make these kinds of statues. There's nothing inside. It's just 3 16th of an inch, about, you know, like half a centimeter of bronze exterior. So yes, the statue is made entirely of bronze, but it's not solid bronze, you know? And if you didn't know that, you might look at that statue on its pedestal and think that's easily thousands of pounds, except it's nowhere close. So this is the part of the story where we get into a bit of guesswork because for the life of me, I can't figure out what the thieves were hoping to accomplish by putting pieces of the statue into a flaming trash can. So I don't know how high you can get a temperature in a trash can, but I, would, I wouldn't have thought it was much higher than a couple of hundred degrees centigrade, depending on what you're doing with it. Not, not as simple as a trash can because you can't get the temperature. This video, literally called Melting Bronze Statues, gives us a sense of what it takes to do the job on a very small scale. So first, you need something capable of heating the bronze to very high temperatures, approaching 1,000 degrees Celsius, 2,000 Fahrenheit. Regular campfires don't do that. You also need time. You need expertise. Like, this isn't roasting marshmallows. It might seem intuitive sense that you could melt it down, but the idea of having a fire hot enough and in the right conditions seems highly unlikely that anybody can pull that off without not only some specialized knowledge, but some specialized skill as well. I think you need to know a little bit about what you're doing, right? You can't just uh, imagine these things. You need molds, you need tools. And I'm not saying it's impossible to do this on the cheap in your basement, but I am saying the trash can at your local park isn't gonna cut it. And if the thief was simply trying to dispose of evidence, like, again, it's just not gonna work. It, it's like trying to drown a rock. Like, like, what are you doing, right? Unfortunately, this is the one part of the story I can't explain. I don't really get it, and the police haven't offered up many answers, except to say. Hopefully this is a testament to all who might think about doing something like this in the future. Uh, the Wichita Police Department works pretty quickly. Uh, they do great work, and uh, you would be found if you did something like that. The man police have charged in this case, Ricky Alderetti, apparently has a pretty long rap sheet. He was actually already in jail, arrested between the time of the statue theft and today on completely unrelated charges, kidnapping and two counts of aggravated burglary. Police won't say what they think his role in the theft was, but they do say there will be more arrests to come.